This presentation looks at theories of the development of moral emotion. This is still an area where there's a lot of disagreement. Indeed, this is a place where theories are only beginning to make the transition from philosophical theories to scientific theories. So we are going to be looking at three separate theories and the focus will be on what they have in common. And uh, that is what, at the most basic level, that is what you as a student should know. More advanced students, an A student, is going to want to know details of some of these theories, especially Height's theory, which is the most recent and the most scientific. So, the first theory we will be looking at should be familiar to you from the first day of class. It's the theory from Mencius. Um, I include this one because it is basic, it is old, and it covers all of the ideas that people working on this still basically hold to be true. Next up, we're going to look in depth at Height's theory, which is the most modern and scientific. And then we will be looking, finally, at the theory presented in your textbook from Jim Lishka. On the first day of class, you read a short passage from the ancient Confucian philosopher Mencius. That passage presented what we would now call an interactionist model of the development of moral competence. Mencius said that we are all born with the seeds of virtue, including, most importantly, the heart that cannot stand to see the suffering of others. However, we need to cultivate these seeds in order to have the classic Confucian virtues. Similarly, modern psychological theories present moral competence as a product of the interaction between nature and nurture. In fact, all of the theories that we are going to be looking at can be represented by a diagram like this one, where on the left you've got a set of basic innate capacities. In this case, Mencius has four. And then across the top we have a process of developing those capacities. In this case, Mencius talks about the, the practice of Confucian cultivation. And then on the right, we've got what the culture would recognize as as regular ethics, in this case the four Confucian virtues. You don't need to know the details of this story. Don't go trying to memorize the Chinese characters or anything like that. What's interesting about this picture is how much it resembles modern theories, even though it was written 2,300 years ago in a very different social setting. Not only does it share the same basic structure as the modern theories we will be looking at, it also highlights a form of compassion or care as the most basic, most important, and foremost of the moral emotions. This model also highlights a prominent problem with this kind of theorizing, that is, taking a feature of your own local culture and imagining that it is a part of universal human morality. While we can all recognize compassion or benevolence as a universal human virtue, ritual piety seems much more restricted to Confucian culture. Now let's take a look at the work of John Haidt. Height, like Mencius, believes that we all come equipped with the seeds of morality. However, he calls these seeds moral intuitions, and he divides them into five sets rather than having four simple seeds. The segment I'm about to play comes from a class taught a few semesters ago on Height. As the segment opens, the class has just completed one of Height's surveys meant to gauge how important the different five sets of moral intuitions are in your personal life. You should have completed this survey or one like it. This is the survey the class did. It compares how much you would have to be paid in order to do various pairs of things. The first pair asks, how much would someone have to pay you to stick a pin in your palm versus how much would someone have to pay you to stick a pin in the palm of a child you do not know?
The other comparisons are about accepting an expensive TV f that a friend got for free versus one that he stole, insulting your nation in front of a local audience versus an international audience, slapping a friend as a part of a skit versus slapping your father, and watching a play where people act like idiots versus one where they act like animals and urinate on stage. Uh, I want to look actually at the at the bottom, um, the, the the bottom row first. Um, the difference here is between attending a performance art piece where people act like idiots um, and attending one where people act like animals. Um, and when they act like animals, that includes crawling around naked and urinating on stage. Um, how many people would have to said that they would have to be pay, have to have to be paid a lot more in order to watch the second one? Ooh, that's interesting. What, um, can you can you talk about? Uh, actually, why don't we go back here? Can you talk about? Did you say? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well. It just awkward. awkward and gross. Yeah. I'm I'm probably sums up what most people think. <laughs> um, why is this? Um, what? Why do you think this? Do you think that this belongs? This question would belong on the same test as sticking a pin in the finger of a, uh, in, the, in the hand of a child? Yes. Why? Uh, because it's part of the norms. Okay. So if you, if you don't agree with their social norms or whatever, mm -hmm. and obviously it doesn't apply, but if you do agree with it and you're falling into that category, then, yeah, yeah that, you know, you wouldn't do this because you, you don't believe that is right to do. Mm -hmm. So your moral ethics tell you one way or the other. There are, there are social norms regarding both inflicting suffering and, well, urine, right? Um, and there are two separate moral emotions associated with violation of these norms, right? Um, if you see a suffering in another, you will feel compassion, you will, feel, you will hurt yourself. Um, Things involving urine and feces um, and people behaving like animals inspires a different emotion. It inspires an emotion of disgust, right? Um, now, these two emotions work fairly independently of each other. That is, some people are more easily disgusted than others. And similarly, some people are more compassionate than others, right? Um, so Hayde has developed this theory um, of five moral intuitions. I'm sorry, we'll go here. Um, basically, he thinks that there are five kinds of emotional judgments that you make. Uh, here, his term is intuition. What he means by intuition is an automatic judgment about a situation, um, it is uh, something that, it is, a it is a judgment whose conclusion just appears to you. You just think that's gross, and there's no reasoning surrounding it. Um, the automatic judgments are based in our emotional system, according to, according to Haid. Um, now, this diagram is online. In fact, it's already on Angel. I just downloaded it from Angel to get it into this classroom. So you don't need to copy everything. Um, but it might be worthwhile um, uh, taking a few notes. So we begin with five sets of instincts. We've already, we just looked at two. One is um, the harm-care instinct. This is, the, the, this, is the, this is what Mencius referred to as the heart that cannot stand to see the suffering of others. You know, it is your feelings of care. Um, it is associated typically with nurturing children. Right? Um, it is the instinct that comes from the sharing of the emotions of others. Down here is another set of, a, of moral emotions which... Um, 
uh, Haid labels the purity and sanctity intuitions. Um, and these are the instincts that come from the need to avoid germs. Um, and so it's a few, these are all the feelings of disgust that are, uh, well, actually, it's not just germs, it's just, but it, it's with a number of physically um, harmful behaviors, um, uh, things that are harmful in the long run, like the incest taboo, um, fear of rotting meat, um, fear of feces and urine. Um, all of these things are basically health mechanisms, right? Um, and they're backed up by a feeling of disgust. Um, and so this gives, these actually are a distinct set of instincts. Um, and they have uh, different effects on um, society as, as they evolve. Okay. The other three sets of instincts um, are the fairness reciprocity instinct, the in-group loyalty instinct, and the authority respect instinct. Actually, let's talk about hitting your father. Um, how many people uh, uh, were, were, would um, have no difficulty? How many people for um, had you know gave no? Listed no difference between uh, column A and column B for slapping someone in the face, either your father or someone else. Oh, look. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter to you that, that you're slapping your father? It's with permission. It's with permission, right? It's done in humor. Uh-huh. Would it change if it was their mother? Because some people might not be as close to their mother as they are their father. Well, I, it would change, but I think he chose father intentionally. Right? Because what he is trying to gauge here is respect for um, socially sanctioned authority, right? Uh, and in a, in a male dominated society, it is, the, it is respect for the father that is most associated with authority, right? And so if you've got a casual relationship with your father and you can just joke around, oh, we're just kidding around, that um, on the one hand, that, um, that makes it easy to do this, to, to slap him in the face. On the other hand, it shows a different kind of relationship with your father than uh, someone who, who grew up in a more authoritarian household or a more authoritarian society um, who, who might feel some resistance there. Certainly, to go back to... Um, Mencius, the, the earlier philosopher that we looked at who talked about moral emotions, for him, you know, instinctive respect for authority was extremely important. Paternal authority was extremely important. And do, um, being in some skit where you slap your father what might just be undignified, too undignified for a true uh, gentleman to, to do. All right. Um, associated with authority is loyalty. Um, people feel loyalty to any number of groups in their lives. Um, family loyalty is important, but uh, there are also there's also loyalty to country, or at, you know, or any kind of team, right? And these are typically teams in competition with other teams. Um, instincts about loyalty um, play a major role in the formation of things like the nation, a, a nation, right? Um, and they are, again, separate from other kinds of instincts. So how many people would feel uncomfortable bad-mouthing the United States on a foreign radio station? Okay. And, and is, is it different for a domestic radio station? It is. Not there, but yeah. You'd feel diff you'd feel, you'd have problems with it. You're, you, you're just thinking, well, look, it's something I don't think is true, and I'm, why, why would I run down my country? Hmm? Where does an animus, Yeah. I'd be scared, like, foreign country, like, I don't know, like, that's what foreign country you're in, I guess, but, like, 
don't know, in America, like, if you say something bad, like, people know how it is. But if you say in a foreign country, like, people just kind of be like, oh, well, this American thing is bad. Right. Yeah. You, you're thinking that it's going to have an impact on your country in a way that... Um, uh, a reflection upon yourself? Yeah. Well, my country, myself, right? You, part of loyalty means identifying. Um, and also worried about, you know, the standing of your country with other countries um, and fear. I hate doesn't emphasize this, but it really is there. In-group loyalty tends to go along with out-group antipathy. In-group, when you tend to like your people more, that means you also tend to dislike the others more. Um, and that includes fear and hatred. Yeah. But you can like something, or mm -hmm. a group of people, or whatever the situation is, but you don't have to agree with them. You don't, you don't have to agree you with them? You still like them. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that you have to dislike or show disrespect or anything like that. Right. You still dislike what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You don't have to reflect on how you feel about the person or the, the country. I mean, I, I dislike a lot of things that, are, that different politicians have done, but in the long run, I'm certainly happy on where I'm at in comparison mm -hmm. to being anywhere else in the, in the world. So I don't have to agree with everything mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. order to um, still respect or have some loyalty. Interestingly, because we're talking about emotions here rather than thought-out political viewpoints, um, worries about contradictions or whether you're allowed to do one thing and at the same time do another don't really apply here, right? Um, well, all that, all that is, we are worried about right now is an instinctive response. How much time do I have? Okay, right? And so if you've got a loyalty instinct, you've got a loyalty instinct no matter what you think of policies, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, the last, the, la, uh, the last one uh, the, the, that we need to talk about is fairness and reciprocity. Um, it looks I think there's pretty solid evidence that people come naturally with a sense of, um, uh, with, with some of the senses you need to cooperate with others, including people who aren't your immediate kin, right? And this includes, you know, the idea that if someone does something for you, you should do something for them. Um, it's a very powerful instinct. Um, there was, there's an anecdote. Uh, back when there was severe famine in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian government donated hurricane relief money to a Central American nation that had suffered a hurricane. And you think, well, God, if you are, um, uh, you know, if, if you are suffering one of the biggest famines of the decade, wh why are you giving money to other people? Well, they felt they owed it because the, um, the Central American nation had helped them out previously. I mean, there is, there, there is a profound instinct towards reciprocity. Um, and so that also is a part of the normal emotional makeup of a human being. Yeah? Why can't some people just accept what you do for them and, and let it go at that, or pass it on to somebody else? Why do they have uh -huh. to... Um, or, or they question your, your motives. Right. One or the other. Right. Um, of course. Um, and according to Haid, you know, it's instinctive. And, and you, you ask, well, why can't you just do this? Because it seems like something you could logically do. Just accept my charity and don't feel indebted. Um, logically, it seems possible. Emotionally, it's not. Because these mechanisms, these instincts are very automatic, right? Um, and so questioning your motives is actually a way of deadening your own emotion. Uh, questioning the other person's motives is a way of deaden deadening your own emotion of gratitude and the urge to reciprocate, right? Well, because if, if the other person's just manipulating you, then you can um, feel okay with avoiding, um, with, with, with not paying them back, right? The constraints are all emotional, they're not rational. 
All right. I want to get to one other, uh, one, one other important point here um, that, uh, that is actually, I think, the thing that has made uh, Hayes research uh, popular in, in the media and in larger circles, which is uh, outside of psychiatry, which is that he thinks that differences in people's emotional morality reflect on political differences in the country right now. Um, in particular, he claims that liberals in America have, have strong attachments to the harm, care, and fairness, reciprocity emotions but are less moved by things like loyalty, authority, and purity, right? Um, so liberals are less, in, uh, less inclined to stand by their country in a time of war because this doesn't, rec doesn't register with them as a moral emotion the way that harm does, including especially harm to people overseas, right? Um, Hayes' main focus actually is on the debate over gay marriage. And there's a reason why he, he looks at that very intensely. It's a moment where emotions are high um, and communication is poor. Um, according to Hayes, for conservatives, the idea of gay sex activates the purity emotions that seems impure. Um, gross, un, you know, like someone urinating on stage, right? And because it activates those emotions, it is perceived as immoral. Now, liberals can share this emotional response, but they don't think of it as a moral response. It's merely an emotional response. It only counts as moral if it relates to harm or fairness. And as a result, in a gay marriage debate, uh, the liberal is going to feel the fairness emotion, going to feel a desire for marriage equality, for fairness under the law, and see that as morally compelling. Whereas any feelings of, of grossness at sexual practices they don't understand are set aside as being <coughs> prejudice as being irrational. It's interesting, everything here is technically irrational. This is all emotional. But um, uh, for, for the liberal, these emotions here are distinctly irrational, whereas these emotions are distinctly moral. Tate actually goes further in the essay that uh, I had you guys read online, uh, and which you really should read. Um, and he says that these emotions, when they develop into societies, develop um, natural groupings, right? Um, our emo Hade calls his model of morality a social intuitionist model. That is, part of morality is bound up in emotional intuitions, but another part of it is bound up in social interaction. And when emotions interact socially, they evolve into ethical communities. So that's why I've got up here, the instinct becomes, uh, through social interaction, becomes an ethic. Um, and you get different kinds of ethics depending on um, uh, what emotions dominate. Okay. Um, if you take the liberal perspective where emotions of uh, harm, care, and fairness, reciprocity dominate, you wind up with what Haid terms the ethic of autonomy. It's an, it is a, an ethic that sees the world as made up of individuals with rights. And the job of morality is to protect the rights of individuals. Right? On the other hand, if your focus is on groups and authority and loyalty, you wind up with an advertisement. Now, what is this? 
Um, you wind up with what Hayd calls the ethic of community, um, which means that the world is made up of groups and institutions, and morality is about the integrity of the institution and playing a role in your institution. Um, the Confucian ethic that Mencius um, believed in was very much an ethic of community. It was about the emperor being the emperor and the, the magistrate being the magistrate and the son being the son. Everyone plays a role in the community in order to protect the integrity of the community. Um, I got six minutes. The religious ethic, according to Hayd, comes out of the purity and sanctity emotions. Um, so the world is about um, uh, the world is ultimately not about individuals or institutions. It's about God, and the job of morality is to protect the sanctity of the divine. Um, and so this is actually what why religious rules tend to focus on food and sex. Um, uh, and this might be more obvious to you if you come from a, an Islamic or Jewish background than um, a Christian background where there are fewer food rules. But for most religions, food rules are really important. They're just as important as sex rules, right? Um, but all of, this, all of these get bound up in religion because, according to Hayd, the instincts um, that create religion are all about purity. Okay. Um, so I want to, in the, the brief time remaining, show you one more slide which explains the relationship between emotion and society um, for Hayde, because it is a social interactionist model, and this is, this is an important thing to look at. Um, you begin with a moral, uh, an eliciting situation, something that will strike a moral um, chord. Um, for instance, someone urinating on stage. This strikes a note of disgust. So you have an intuition. An individual A will have an intuition, a feeling of disgust. And that leads to a judgment this performance is disgusting. This should be banned, right? Um, this is, you know, people all the time will try and ban pornography or things that they feel are disgusting, right? So this, you have then have a judgment. Well, once you make the judgment, it becomes public. You start telling other people about your judgment, and that affects other people's intuitions. Um, which in turn affects their judgments, which in turn affects their intuitions. But a feedback of judgment and intuition between individuals. On the outermost periphery of this, according to Haid, is rationality. The ability to actually justify verbally what you're doing. Um, people first make a judgment, and then they try and reason. They come up with reasons for that judgment. And the reasons can reinforce their ability to influence others, right? Um, so if I simply say that's disgusting, I might affect your intuitions a little. But if I say that's disgusting and here's a good reason why it's disgusting, I will affect your intuitions more. Furthermore, if I'm really lucky, I can use my own reasoning to affect my own behavior. That is... Using um, re rationality, I can diminish my own intuitions. This is exactly the process that Hayd sees liberals engaged in when they diminish instincts of loyalty, purity, um, and authority. Right? You might have an instinctive um, judgment against gay sex, but then when you reason about it, you think, well, there's no harm here, there's no injustice here, and so I'm going to diminish my intuitions rationally. And so 
feedback loop, number uh, individual feedback in uh, line six here, um, typically isn't strong, but can be very strong sometimes, and that's a, that can have an effect on society. For the most part, though, um, the foundation of morality is the interaction between individuals' emotional intuitions, with reason um, at best pushing things in different directions. Okay. Um, that's Hayes' model. I wanted to spend time on other things, but w I, you can always read about it and that sort of thing. Okay. Thank you. Last up is the system in your textbook. This system is important because it brings together a lot of the themes of the moral emotions chapter. The first thing to note about Lishka's system is the process of maturation. For Mencius, one developed morality through Confucian cultivation. For John Haidt, it was a matter of social interaction mediated partially by reason. For Lishka, Matur moral maturation is a matter of internalization, the process by which we take a moral rule and make it our own so that we continue to obey the rule even if no one is looking, even if we don't think we'll ever be punished or caught. For Lishka, this process changes ordinary moral emotions, which are immediate, largely innate reactions into what he calls moral sentiments, which are more generalized and learned. Again, emotions related to compassion are the most important of all the moral emotions, as with the other systems. Here, sympathy, a feeling of distress at the pain of others, becomes care, which is a more, more of a shared emotion that is part, part of an ongoing relationship. This sentiment leads to an interesting phenomenon called the transparent self. With the trans transparent self, the needs of another are perceived directly as your own needs without being filtered through your own ideas or perspective. This idea was extensively investigated by the philosopher Eva Cate. The next two moral sentiments evolve out of the moral emotions of shame and guilt. Shame and guilt are closely related moral emotions, and normally we would use those words interchangeably. Lishka, however, follows the anthropologist Ruth Benedict in distinguishing between them, and there are a couple of pages in your textbook discussing the difference. Guilt is more bound up in harm to others, while shame involves violating social norms that might change your status in the community. What's important here is that these two enforcer emotions evolve into different sentiments once they are internalized. Shame grows into a sense of honor, the idea that certain acts are simply beneath a person of your status. Guilt grows into a sense of duty, a felt obligation often associated with a social role like being a parent, but not always. The last sentiment is nobility, which grows out of a sense of admiration. This sentiment is interesting because it is the only sentiment that talks about what we want to be rather than merely what we want to avoid becoming. The other sentiments provide a moral ground, but nobility provides us with a moral sky to reach for. There is also an extensive discussion of conflicting concepts of nobility from Nietzsche and Confucius, which was the subject of an online exercise you should have done. That covers the basics of Lishka's theory, and with that, our theories of the development of the moral emotions. To summarize, all these theories say that morality grows out of some set of seeds or innate emotions or capacities which can be cultivated or neglected. Chief among these capacities for all theories is an emotion of sympathy which grows into some kind of ethic of care. The theories add different emotions to this basic sense of care and different people may feel these emotions with differing strength. The process of cultivating the emotions also varies from the, between these theories. For Mencius, it was a Confucian cultivation process. For Haidt, social interaction. And for Lishka, internalization.